but that Rush Huey, it's no different than the shit A-Train shoots up. Everything comes with a price. Get Some is the name of the third episode of The Boys Season 1. It introduces the audience to new characters and relationship dynamics and peels back more of the layers on characters that haven't been explored as much beforehand. On the side of the Seven and the Soups in general, we meet Popclaw, A-Train's secret girlfriend who has powers of her own, and much like A-Train struggles with both an inferiority complex about her status in the superhero hierarchy and an addiction to Compound V. On the side of the boys, we're introduced to Mother's Milk, who brings a fresh new energy to the team. Like Butcher, he is a leader, but with a far greater EQ, which means he is an important figure to bring more warmth and empathy to this highly damaged group of criminals. But he is also very insightful, which means he can reveal things about these characters that they may be hiding or be in denial about. This is about Becca, isn't it? It's always about Becca with you. However, Mother's Milk is far more than just the group therapist or Mother Hen. He has a history with the boys, minus Huey, of course, which means that Butcher has to get manipulative to wrangle this group back together since Mother's Milk still harbors negative feelings towards Frenchie, so... Their reunion goes about as well as you'd expect. Water under the bridge! You tell that to Mallory's grandkids. Tell them it's water under the bridge. It wasn't my fault, huh? The Seven have an unpleasant reunion of their own between Homelander and Queen Maeve. Their encounters are disturbing in more than one way. On the personal side, we learn that they used to date, and despite Homelander's recurring tension with Madeline, he still exhibits all the signs of being a controlling, abusive ex towards Maeve. If I ever really thought that you'd fallen for someone else, I don't think I could handle it. Then, on the professional side, we have the complete perversion of what audiences are used to seeing from idyllic superheroes, as Homelander and Maeve instead display an approach that bears far more resemblance to the ugly realities of law enforcement in the real world. You know the drill. He shot at us first. Atta girl. Even the majestic scoring and dialogue when they first arrive on the scene and play the part they want people to believe in seems to mock the whole idea of putting superheroes on such elevated pedestals. Homelander, Maeve. Captain, you guys are the real heroes. We're just glad we can help, right? That's right. Mother's Milk delivers a particularly significant speech in this episode about how everything comes with a price. The title of this episode is Get Some, perhaps as a reference to the victorious or self-indulgent mantra that is applicable to things like A-Train and Popclaw partaking in Compound V and the things they do while under its influence. However, I find the phrase, everything comes with a price, to be a far more interesting central thesis to focus on for this episode. Though the revelations about Compound V are important to drive the plot and characters forward towards bigger revelations to come about the extent to which Compound V has been used on the public, everything comes with a price is an important reminder of the consequences that characters have to face for their actions. And this facilitates a deeper exploration into the emotional turmoil of those characters as they deal with those consequences. After Annie rescued a woman from being assaulted by two men in an alley, she was heavily reprimanded for not taking corporate issues like liability into consideration. However, in this episode, corporate takes a more positive view of her actions because the video of her fighting off the men has gone viral and the response from the public has been good. That's good, right? It is fantastic. You're pulling through the roof. This leads to an inevitable rush to capitalize on the buzz, which means Annie has to sit through a pitch from marketing, and she is pressured into donning a new costume that's significantly more revealing than her previous one. Annie's disdain for this outfit is much less about feeling objectified as it is about her feeling inauthentic. 
Admittedly, it's uncomfortable to get catcalled while meeting a young fan who just wants a selfie, but the deeper conflict is that Annie's dream of joining the Seven isn't all that she thought it would be. I don't know if they really want you to be a hero. I think they just want you to look like one. Huey and Annie's initial connection is forged through a combination of a random chance encounter and a deeper common ground of having fresh traumatic experiences. The parallels in their journeys furthers the legitimacy of their bond even when they keep secrets about the groups they're working in. Being in the Seven or being in the Boys forces both of them to question who they are and who they want to be. You're, uh, you're Starlight. That's, how did I not realize that? Being that Annie has to deal with the consequences of fighting off men in an alley and getting caught on camera doing it, she is learning that joining the Seven comes with a price. Joining the Seven was her lifelong dream, but beyond that, her dream was first and foremost about being a hero in the sense of using her abilities to help those in need. Sweetie, you know what? Save your money. I like that one much better. The episode opens with Huey reeling from the aftermath of his compounded trauma. The show's major starting point was Huey losing his girlfriend in an explosion of flesh because A-Train ran right through her. And now, he has taken the initiative to do that to another person translucent. The parallel is important because The Boys is a show that pushes past a simplistic hero-villain binary and plays up the morally gray aspects of both sides. Admittedly, the anti-corporate sentiments of the show mean that the Seven are treated as considerably more villainous than The Boys, but the boys still do some very ethically questionable things, and Huey is more than just a passive observer to them. You know, we don't actually need to sneak in anything. All I need is her IPv6 number. Every desktop, every smart TV in the house has a camera. It's Huey who suggests using his IT skills to hack into Popclaw's systems so the boys will be able to surveil her in order to follow their lead from Translucent about getting to A-Train. Huey doesn't only have have to grapple with his own trauma of losing Robin, he also has to see her killer's face everywhere because of marketing and also because of his own badly aged affinity for superheroes. The biggest question he seems to be grappling with is whether or not the price of joining the boys and getting revenge will be his soul. He lashes out at his father to an extent that he never has before. How much I I fucking hate pizza rolls. Now you love pizza rolls. When I was seven! He has mixed feelings about having pulled the trigger on Translucent. In some ways, just right in that moment, it felt kind of good. When I had the detonator in my hand, I felt like a, I felt like a rush. Not good. Like I felt alive. In regards to this particular point, my interpretation is that Huey is a flawed person, just like everyone is flawed, and he is feeling a lot of pain. He is not someone that has crossed the point of no return, particularly considering how he clearly feels considerable guilt over getting involved with Annie since Butcher sees that as an asset to his own agenda, whereas Huey is genuinely interested in her. The parallels between Huey and Butcher aren't lost on me either. Mother's Milk mentions Butcher's wife for the first time on the show in this episode, which is the first glimpse we get of the similarity in motivations behind both Huey and Butcher's efforts to take down members of the Seven. The final conflict between them in the surveillance van when Huey is concerned about Popclaw's landlord... <laughs> Can't breathe. All right, hold on. Hang about, hang about. Not so fast. And Butcher stops him from trying to leave the van and go back into the apartment. It's very easy to see Butcher as what Huey could become if he were to continue down this path of vengeance against superheroes. When Butcher outright explains how even if Huey left the van, he would have never been able to make it to the apartment on time, and that even if he had made it there, he would not have been able to stop her, you realize that Butcher is right. He didn't do anything wrong. He was dead already. That's bullshit. 
He sounds heartless when he first says that the man was dead already, but in actuality what he was saying was coming from his considerable amount of experience in battling superheroes. If Huey were to fall into this quest for vengeance as deeply as Butcher and for as long as Butcher, who knows what sort of toll it would take on him and what sort of prices he would have to pay. You get a number? Yeah. Huey? Uh, yeah. Got it. Hi everyone, it's Lady Genevieve. Thank you so much for watching my latest video essay review on The Boys. This one was on episode 3, which means I still have 5 more episodes to do before season 2 premieres. So subscribe and follow along as I will be making my way through what's left for me to do. I will also be linking a playlist of all of the videos that I've done on The Boys in the pinned comment of this video. Feel free to catch up on what I've already posted if you are new here. I didn't get to go over every little detail of what was in this episode, mostly because I had a main point that I was trying to focus on and letting that point flow meant that not every detail of what happens in the episode was going to get discussed as thoroughly. But I must say, I really loved the part where Huey had just had that falling out with his father and he goes to leave and Frenchie is waiting for him outside and then Frenchie decides to open up just a little bit about his own father. My father was a bipolar. One night when I was 10, he tried to smother me with a Hello Kitty duvet. Tomer is really funny in his delivery, even though what he's saying is actually something that's quite horrible when you think about the full context of Frenchie's backstory, which gets revealed in more detail later on. And by that, I mean that Frenchie reveals his full backstory to Kimiko right after he meets her, because he loves her immediately. Don't forget to like and comment on this video since it really helps out my channel. And if you would like to follow me on social media, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero. The next video I will be doing on the boys will be really fun for me to make because it is episode four, which means it's Kimiko's first introduction. Unsurprisingly, she is my favorite and all I want in life is to be as powerful and terrifying as her. See you in the next one. Bye.